Coming up this week on the show, we've got something special for you. We're going to be giving you an in-depth look at all the graphical PCBSD utilities. That's right, BSD doesn't just have to be command line anymore. We're also going to have the usual round of answers to your emails and, of course, the latest headlines from the past week. All on BSD Now, the place to be. SD. Now, episode 49, the PCBSD Tour, recorded August 6th, 2014. Hey, I'm your host, Chris Moore. And I'm Alan Jude. We're glad to have you guys with us this week. We got an exciting show coming at you. We're doing something a little special today. We're doing a, a tutorial slash introduction video I made of PCBSD 10.02. So uh, we'll play that a little later in the episode. But uh, before we do that, of course, we're going to get right into your headlines for the week. So uh, first up this week, some free BSD news. It looks like the foundation has released their semi-annual newsletter, yep. which has a uh, couple interesting articles in it, including some status updates on various projects. But uh, what's the first thing you want to talk about that, Alan? Uh, yeah, they have uh, it opens up with the greeting from the executive director, and then there's the letter from mm -hmm. the president, which is talking about the elevator pitch for FreeBSD and trying sure. to hone that message when people ask why they should use FreeBSD instead of something else, having a very strong answer that's also very short. Mm -hmm. and uh yeah because you don't want people's eyes to glaze over yeah it's like, uh, if you dig into technical <laughs> stuff or y you don't want it to also come out basically as an also ran or like you know it, it can do what linux does but slightly better or whatever um mm -hmm. you know yeah so oftentimes when somebody asks you what freebsd is you're like well you've heard of linux right it's like that but better and that's not really a, a good explanation of what it is and or why it's better or you know sure. it just makes it sound like you know linux silly cousin instead of the other way around <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh he, he talks about his uh adventures trying to to narrow down that message and you know it came down to something like yeah what do you, what's what's the thing you do most with technology and it's like well i like email and stuff on my phone and checking sports scores Connect and Connected to the net, basically, the whole time. Yeah, and it's, so it's like, you know, uh, there's a lot of technology involved in making it possible to do all those things on your phone. Uh, a good chunk of that's all common applications, right? Sending and receiving data on the network, routing that data to the right place, mm -hmm. warehousing the data, you know, storing pictures and videos and stuff uh, in a stable and secure way. Uh, that all utilizes servers, and those servers run FreeBSD, right? The sure. core functionality for things like Netflix, WhatsApp, FlightAware, Yahoo Mail, cell phones, including the iPhone and Android, all that mm -hmm. has FreeBSD technology in it, and that's what it is. You know, uh, mm -hmm. if FreeBSD broke, a lot of things you do every day would stop working. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, that's definitely a good way to open up the uh, newsletter this time around. Yeah. But I'm I'm looking through some of the other stuff we have in here. Um, you know, some of the things that are getting me excited though are some of the development project oh, updates. Yes. So uh, we'll start off with the first one we have here, uh, updated system console. So the new VT system console, of course, we've mentioned this in previous episodes. It's a replacement for the uh, legacy system console. It's been in FreeBSD pretty much forever. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to bring a lot of new improvements, including better integration with graphics modes and broader character sets support. So that's pretty slick. It'll allow a double width characters. So say allowing Asian character sets right on the console. Yep. Pretty cool. And Russian, um, you, Cyrillic, and so on. Yeah, Russian, anything... Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll just finally have support for all that. A, uh, they also had a new UEFI frame buffer driver, which, uh, again, very necessary and neat to see that that's happening. Um, it looks like uh, in the transition, though, they've included both the consoles in a single kernel, so you can toggle between them yes. with a uh, with an environment variable. Yeah, so that way you can have uh, one image on the website instead of having to download a separate image to use one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. And uh, they're targeting having this available into uh, FreeBSD 10.1, so probably November-ish is when we'll, uh, people will start playing this on a release. But I guess it's uh, we just pulled we actually just pulled this into our 10 stable images for PCBSD mm -hmm. that we're building now. I'm looking forward to trying it out. Okay, next up in their projects, though, they also mentioned UEFI and Secure Boot. I guess there's a lot of UEFI stuff going on at the moment, but uh, yeah, I this guess. is a project they've funded uh, to basically make this work. 
Yeah, I was talking to Ed Mast about it in Cambridge, and it sounds like it's mm -hmm. uh, mostly working, although currently it only does uh, uh, UFS, and you can't do root on ZFS with it yet, but they're working on mm -hmm. that. They're getting there. They're getting there. Yeah. What's, uh, do you remember what some of the technical limitations were on why uh, well, ZFS didn't work? In order to do uh, settings and modules and stuff, uh, basically, because of the way UEFI works, you have uh, that FAT32 partition where all the stuff lives for uh, UFI and mm -hmm. or UFI. So your loader.conf would have had to have been there for it to do stuff with the way uh, they designed yes. it originally. Uh, so mm -hmm. instead, they built a very small shim loader like the boot one or boot zero or whatever that goes there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the UEFI boots that, which then kind of does more like the regular boot process. Uh, mm -hmm. That way your loader.conf is still where you expect it to be. Um, the downside is that that shim currently is very primitive and all it does is look for the u first UFS partition it can find and boot off of it. Ugh. Yeah. And so yeah. it currently doesn't do ZFS. Uh, uh -huh. But yeah, it's kind of a interesting. It's like... Yeah, we really you don't want to have to put your loader.conf on a FAT32 partition in order to set settings and stuff, but yeah, mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see what we can come up with uh, to solve those problems while having to work in other people's frameworks that never considered FreeBSD as something that would need to be booted, right? I'll have to check. I, when we pulled a new version of Grub this week, it had some some changes in the the log there about a UFI support for booting FreeBSD kernels. Oh. So I'll have to check that because maybe we can bypass the whole ZFS loader thing. Just load the kernel direct and then um, go from there. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll have to look into it. But uh, one of the things they mentioned in the article here, though, is Secure Boot. Um, that, I guess, has been delayed a little bit. They said their plan relies on a Microsoft signed shim loader. Yep. And they said Microsoft's added some new requirements to the process. So they still want to do it and they plan on doing it. It's just they're going to adapt and the yep. plan is necessary to make that happen, but it is delayed a little bit. Probably won't be in 10.1 then. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed for 10.2 though. Yep. So another cool feature um, that they reported is the uh, modern auto mount daemon. I've yes. seen a lot of commits going by for this and traffic on the mailing list. Yep. But a lot of people you know, have reported this over the years of FreeBSD users not, not really enjoying the uh, current auto mounter AMD. So there's been a new FreeBSD Foundation-sponsored project to develop a new auto mounter, which uh, will hopefully address all the concerns people had with the old implementation. Yeah. Uh, so, I saw a short presentation on it in uh, Cambridge, and it looks like it's coming along very nicely. Uh, it does. It can be especially useful when now, you know, especially when you're dealing with uh, ZFS, each separate data set is a separate share. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you don't want to probably don't want to keep every one of those mounted all the time, but need to be able to access them on demand. And sure. uh, so, yeah, that's definitely uh, something that'll be quite useful. Cool. So uh, some stuff's going on there. I guess they're expecting to merge it in probably for FreeBSD 10.2 is what they're targeting at the moment. So cool. uh, probably uh, mid to late next year, I would imagine. But uh, still, cool stuff, exciting things happening, and that's really cool that the FreeBSD Foundation's, of course, sponsoring all these things. Yep. And uh, let's see, last up, they mentioned, of course, the FreeBSD Journal. That's kind of one of the big projects that uh, is new this year that they've been supporting. And, uh, you know, their FreeBSD Foundation is, of course, uh, still contributing and helping with that. But I guess this period so far, we have, what, three issues out now? Um, yeah, I think the fourth one is just about to come out. They said they've attracted about 3,000 subscribers to it already. They're expected to break the 5,000 mark by year's end. So congratulations, right. guys. That's really cool. But uh, yeah, there's just some some details here on where you can purchase it and how they now have them available in the Apple, Google, and Kindle stores. And they run you about uh, 20 bucks a year yep. for six issues, or you can do $7 per issue. So uh, let's see. The next issue, August 7th. So tomorrow. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So before you guys see this on Friday, <laughs> the next yep. issue will be out. Cool. Okay. Well, I guess that's about all the FreeBSD Foundation news. Yeah, for the and week. they just had a, an extra rundown oh. of uh, what they did for all the different conferences. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Post from uh, New York's BSDCon, Asia BSDCon, BSD Can, uh, the yeah. Ottawa Developer Summit, the Ottawa Vendor Summit, uh, and then the Developer Summit in Cambridge, which we just had, and then uh, also forward-looking stuff for the EuroBSDCon 2014, mm -hmm. and also uh, FreeBSD being at the uh, Grace. Uh, Hopper uh, okay. celebration thing uh, in Arizona in October as well. And then they mm -hmm. talk about the uh, travel uh, grant and travel grant uh, recipients and people, you know, uh, one of the things the FreeBSD Foundation does is make sure that people can actually get to the conferences 
you know, especially, mm-hmm. you know, the developer summits and stuff. It's the developers from all over, all over the world are volunteering their time and working on stuff. And so sometimes they can't afford to fly off to uh, England for a week. Sure. And the uh, foundation makes sure that people can get there. Yeah. And Plane I know, fights aren't free, folks. Yeah. And, uh, I noticed <laughs> that the uh, Open ZFS Vendor Summit uh, later this year is actually on the list. So, uh, you oh, know, cool. if you work with that, if you're working on ZFS and FreeBSD, you should definitely check that out as well. Okay. And they uh, closed the newsletter with a nice little uh, uh, statement from Limelight Networks, which is a, a big content delivery network uh, that used to deliver a lot for Netflix before they uh, built their own thing. But um, mm-hmm. uh, they uh, use FreeBSD on over 10,000 machines. Uh, oh, nice. So they, uh, they kind of talk about why they use FreeBSD and how that works for them. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay, well, next up in the news, we got a cool article here that I actually really enjoyed reading today about mm-hmm. uh, OpenBSD on the Intel NUC. Yes. And uh, for those that don't know, the NUCs are just little tiny systems. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Intel, how would you... Intel calls it the next unit of computing. Uh, mm-hmm. I have one here. You yeah, see, show it off. Uh, it is not very big at all. Uh, mm-hmm. This is one of the i3 ones, uh, the last generation, the Ivy Bridge. Um, so this one has the HD Graphics 4000. So this one actually is supported by FreeBSD. I also mm-hmm. have one of the newer i5 ones that's the HD Graphics 5000, like the one in the, the article here. And sadly, FreeBSD doesn't have that driver yet, but hopefully that will happen very soon. Yes. Uh, so yes. on this one, on the back, you have uh, Ethernet, two HDMI ports, uh, two USB ports, uh, and the power and a Kensington lock. And then on the front... Uh, one more USB port. On my mm-hmm. newer one, I have two USB ports, uh, audio and IR on the front. On the back, I have a mini HDMI display port, Ethernet, some more USB, the lock, and uh, I think that's about it, yeah. Um, so on this one, uh, it comes basically as a little board inside with an i3 on it, and then it has expansion slots. It takes two sticks of RAM, uh, regular mm-hmm. SODIMs like a laptop, uh, and then it's got um, two mini PCIe slots, one for a wireless card, so the same wireless card you put in a laptop, uh, and one for an mSATA, so that mm-hmm. you have some storage. Uh, the i5 I have actually is slightly taller as well, uh, and it has room, in addition to an mSATA and the, SS- and the uh, wireless card, can also fit a 2.5-inch SSD. Oh, that's nice. Uh, but anyway, now that you know what a NUC is. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the article, though, that kind of brought this whole thing up is about running OpenBSD on it. Yes. And uh, this is a cool article written by Gabriel Guzman talking about uh, he was looking for a small form factor PC and he came across the device, which Alan just showed well, yeah. you there. Uh, the other nice thing about this is that mm-hmm. uh, they give you the mounts on the back. Uh, so, you know, after you put it on, you screw these things in and they give you the plate and it can connect to the uh, VESA mount on the back of your TV. So oh, the, yes. the mount you would normally use to mount your TV on the wall, if your TV is freestanding instead, you can mount the NUC on the back of the TV so mm-hmm. it doesn't take up any space. So yeah, or, that's you know, it's even on the back of your monitor at your desk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely pretty slick. But I guess he said in, in his case they were looking to drive uh, some 50-inch TVs that him had put up in the office mm-hmm. in their IT department. So again, perfect, uh, perfect device for that. So he talks you know, a little bit about the hardware specs, which Alan just kind of went over here. And um, some of what he had to do to make OpenBSD run on it. One of the things I guess he got was a, a mini display port to dual link DVI adapter, a powered one. Yeah, so uh, the and newer then, ones have, instead of two HDMI ports, have a one mini HDMI and one display port. And so the display mm-hmm. port allows you to connect multiple monitors. Sure. So you had to buy that little device, and then he was able to boot over the network with Pixie Boot and install OpenBSD. So he said, I mean, that was pretty much all he did, it looks like. He said yeah. it was pretty much a straightforward installation at that point. And then it just up and runs. And, of course, he had posted a link to his uh, D-Message output. So if you'd like to take a look and see what uh, is supported on that device and what's on it, it's a great way to do so. And we'll have that link in the show notes. Um, I yeah, think that's so about the it article, with that one. Yeah, the article covers uh, actually doing the Pixie Boot install. And uh, so mm-hmm. TJ also linked to our tutorial on doing that as well. Uh, I'm hoping, actually, I just got this second one this week, the one with the, the older i3, uh, so that it will support FreeBSD. And uh, I'm going to mm-hmm. try putting PCBSD on it uh, probably this weekend. And so hopefully cool. I'll be able to show off what that does. Let me know how that goes. Exactly. Nice. Okay. 
Let's see here. Next up in the uh, news section, we got uh, Bay Area FreeBSD Users Group. I guess uh, they finally uploaded some new presentation videos to uh, YouTube. And the uh, first one that uh, we'll mention here is by Craig Rodriguez about a libvert and Beehive integration. Yes, I'm of course, actually... we'll have all the links to these. I want to actually watch that one. I do want to learn it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so they're talking about using libvert and uh, the efforts to uh, update that so it can support Beehive so that you can use existing virtual machine management software uh, and integration stuff to be able to create and manage and destroy uh, Beehive instances. So very that would nice. be very interesting. Mm -hmm. So the second video we got is also uh, by uh, Adrian Chad titled yeah. Upcoming RSS Enhancements to the FreeBSD Network Stack. Yes, that's the and, uh, uh, recede size scaling, I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. that's basically spreading out the, the load of incoming connections across the CPUs. We kind of have an article to go along with it that Adrian wrote a blog post. Yeah. So if you'd like to kind of dig into what that is and, and read along with the video, that would be a cool way to do it. But uh, definitely cool. Thanks for uploading those guys. And, of course, we'll put the call out. If we need more videos like this, if we find them, let yes. us know. Or if you find some, yeah, send them in so we can highlight them on the show and you know, give people the word exactly. where they can find the stuff. Yes. Okay, um, next up, uh, our buddy Ted Ewingst, who we've had on the show in the past, has a uh, new blog post talking about a TLS decompression. Yeah. So uh, this time it's more about what he removed, not what he added. Yeah, he didn't like actually SSL. <laughs> add a decompression feature. He just took out the compression feature. Yeah, um, yeah. So I guess the, this is actually kind of funny, but the original commit message when he did this work was just decompress Libra SSL. Yeah. with zero details so this is kind of the follow-up to that like okay what did that actually mean what did you do here so uh in the article he goes through you know different network layers and where compression is applied and how code is, has to be refactored for that and uh you know i love at the end he just kind of talks about uh i might download a zip file maybe you have png files the web server if configured just wrong can apply http compression to it yep. if it's https the tls layer compress it again if i'm using an ssh tunnel that can compress it if it's traveling over ipsec it gets compressed again and um, it can also get it compressed again by IP compression. So how many layers of compression do we really need? Yeah, how much CPU so, time is being wasted compressing yeah. uncompressible data? Yeah, 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 definitely. So, uh, I mean, the short end of it is he just removed the compression functionality from it. Yeah. There's it's plenty like, of other places yeah, you can uh, do your compression. Yeah, it should be done separately before the encryption rather than being mm -hmm. done uh, as part of the encryption. Definitely. <laughs> but uh, interesting read, interesting yeah. read. Cool. Okay. Well, that's the end of our weekly news segment. Of course, uh, we want to mention our sponsor for this week, and that uh, we'll start with TarSnap this week. Mm -hmm. So uh, you guys have heard us talking about TarSnap definitely the last couple weeks, and uh, you know they're still out there doing their thing. And if you're not signed up with them, what is wrong with you? You need to get out and do that now. And, do, uh, do you not love your data? Do you, do you not want right, to keep right? your is data? Your data not important to you? <laughs> so if, especially, I mean, if you're not backing up, first of all, you got to get some kind of backup, and and you yep. need to have something offsite, of course, too. Exactly. So uh, Tar Snap is where you're going to want to go to do that. I mean, not only is it cheap and uh, really cost effective, but uh, also it's fully encrypted and encrypted yep. in such a way that nobody except you has access to the data with your key. So protect your key file because if you lose that, Colin's not going to be able just to magically pull your data back out of thin air. Yeah, uh, unlike right. other places, it's not physically possible because of the way it's mm -hmm. encrypted and so you know that's the peace of mind that you get from from knowing that you know even if they wanted to they couldn't get your data back mm -hmm. so that, yeah, that's know. a good that's a feature that's yeah. important <laughs> yeah it's a trade-off most of the other places wouldn't have made in order to give you that extra security yep and it gives you warm fuzzies when you look at the costs and go, oh, it's 250 pico dollars yes. a byte. So, I mean, obviously very inexpensive to do this. Yeah, that's if you're, trillions of a dollar, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're storing a small amount of data, I mean, five bucks may last you a long time. Yeah. So, definitely. Uh, very, very cool. Yeah. And uh, that URL is going to be uh, tarsnap.com slash BSD now. So you'll want to check that out and uh, get signed up with an account, start trying it. Uh, the cool thing is Tarsnap's not just for BSD users. So if you have you know, a variety of boxes around the office or home, um, it can do everything from BSD to Linux to OSX to Minix to Open Indiana, Sigwin, and, uh, and it says even probably many more Unix-like operating systems. So. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of support out there for a variety of platforms. Yep, and the and command course, line client is uh, based on tar. So yeah, 
you'll already know how to use it as soon as you download it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no huge learning curve to get set up. Yeah. So you'll definitely want to play around with TarSnap and uh, get backing up your data now. Okay, we'll be back in just a moment with our next segment. So welcome this week. We're going to be taking a look at a PCBSD 10.02, which is a, a point release of the uh, 10 dot release, uh, 10.0 release series, of course. Um, this won't be so much of a tutorial as more of it is a demo, just kind of showing off some of the features of PCBSD and uh, just explain to people how and why we do certain things. I know this is something that uh, we've had a lot of viewers request on BSD now, so I'm glad we're finally able to, to do it and present this for you. And uh, of course, if there's things that we don't mention in this video or don't get to, uh, you know, write us and let us know so that we can mention them in a future video. Okay, but uh, for the purposes of this demo today, we're gonna be taking a look at a default PCBSD desktop um, booted into KDE. So KDE is my preferred window manager of choice slash desktop, and um, it's what's going to be selected by default on the installer. Of course, people who've used PCBSD know that's not what you're limited to. So during installation, if you decide to pick GNOME 3, you know, Cinnamon, Mate, and then some of the smaller ones like, say, Fluxbox or Rat Poison, whatever, you can pretty much customize this any way you want. But for today's demo, we're going to be in KDE. If you did this through another window manager, it may look slightly different, but all the core utilities will still be there. So you're not going to lose uh, key functionality and, and lose access to anything that we've done for the desktop. So without further ado, let's take a look here. So I've created a new user on my system. I've already done the installation. When you first boot into PCBSD, your desktop, of course, you're going to get a welcome screen, which uh, you can conveniently click here to get rid of if you don't want to see it again. But, you know, first time you connect, you may want to uh, take a look at some of the, uh, the help dialogues we've written here, just telling you where things are at. You know, welcome to your system. This is how you configure stuff. You have some helpful tips on how to use uh, backups and recovery, etc. And of course, uh, staying up to date, very important. So uh, you'll want to take note. That's our update manager down there. And of course, links to important locations in the community where you can get a hold of people and discuss and to help us improve PCBSD in every way. So we're already done with this. We've read it. I don't want it to come back. So let's close that. And uh, first up, we're going to take a look uh, at the documentation, though. So the first time you install PCBSD, and on every box, we include the PDF of the handbook, which is really, really well done. Let's open that up now. And since, of course, it's a PDF, you can transfer that to your e-readers and uh, any other device that you like to view PDFs on. But uh, this is an extremely detailed document on how to use PCBSD, everything from development stuff to uh, just everyday user information. Um, you can see we even have sections on the different window managers, etc. But uh, yeah, I'd, I would highly recommend anybody who's uh, just getting their feet wet with PCBSD start here. The docs we have really are quite excellent, and uh, just about anything you need to do um, from an advanced perspective will also be listed in here. So we're going to close that for now. But um, one of the first things you're going to do if you're, on, of course, on a laptop or uh, need to get network connectivity, you're going to want to figure out where do I connect. So down on the tray here, I have my wireless utility where I can click and scan for networks, etc., and uh, see what's available. It's pretty typical. Um, you just click a network, put in your key, and away it goes. Of course, there's information that's going to be recorded about this device as well, and we can set some advanced options if you'd like to. Um, country codes, if you're out of country and you have access to other wireless frequencies, you may want to set that. But of course, uh, since we're developed here in the U.S., it's just going to default to U.S., so we'll go ahead and close that. I'm already connected to my network, so nothing too interesting to see there. But uh, one of the crown jewels of PCBSD is our, uh, our application package management, etc. And we call that the App Cafe. I already have a copy of it open down here. So the first time you open it up, obviously, once you've got your desktop installed, you probably want to install third-party applications to make it do something useful for you. So uh, the default screen here is going to just kind of show you some recommendations, you know, new applications that have been released to the uh, repository. Down here, we can see that uh, it lists 21 or 2,196 applications available, but there's a total of 23,000 plus packages. So what that is, is these are PBIs. These are basically all these guys here with icons and metadata and extra information, desktop icons, etc. And this is the raw FreeBSD package database, which we can also install from. You just may not have a desktop icon for certain things or is uh, helpful information. But, uh, you know, most users will probably want to grab a web browser. So in this case, I'm going to click on Chromium. 
I've already gotten installed on this system because uh, I do use this. This is my laptop. And of course, there's some handy links here where you can launch it, contact the maintainer, whoever uh, ported this over to FreeBSD. We have the option to uh, install desktop shortcuts or remove desktop shortcuts. So if you accidentally install something, delete the icon, can't remember what the command line was to get into it, you can always come back in here and, and reinstall the uh, icons for you. Um, a neat feature in 10.02 for the App Cafe is we now have the ability to install applications in jails. So this may not be as useful for, say, Chromium if you want to run this on your main desktop, but say you bring up Nginx or like Plex Media Server or something in the App Cafe, you can then say, that's cool, let's put that in a jail because maybe that's going to be a uh, internet-facing service or something and you probably don't want to run that you know, outside of a jail. You want to use the built-in security jails offer. Um, so you would just click that and pick the jail and away it would go. Um, so for Chromium here, you can see we have uh, screenshots down below. You can click and embiggen those if you want to see them full screen. We also will mention, say, plugins. So, of course, you have your web browser, but what if you want Java? Well, cool. You can click on Ice-T web application and get your Java plugin. We might mention some similar stuff that's related. And for those who are you know, a little bit more uh, power users, we also list the build options. So when we built Chromium, these were the options that were enabled or disabled. Now, if I click on the installed tab, I can actually see what's installed on my desktop. And you can see at the moment, I've got a number of things already installed. And uh, clicking on them or double clicking them will take you back kind of the store page form. So you can view information about that application. Of course, you can uh, go here, we can right click and say uninstall. Um, there's a feature in PackageNG where we can lock the current version. So when we're doing updates to newer packages, I can say I don't really want to upgrade Firefox, so leave it at that version for now. And of course, shortcuts to add and remove desktop icons here. Now, um, as an advanced tip, we have uh, the way PCBSD works. So we do a two package repos essentially. We do a production repo, which is updated quarterly. And so once uh, we come out with a new release, like 10.0.2 uh, in this case, it'll have a new set of uh, packages that are marked stable, and we don't touch those for three months because you don't want bleeding edge stuff and things that are breaking necessarily hitting your stable desktop. However, if you are a bleeding edge user or developer and want to stay up to date with you know the stuff that came out like this morning, it is possible to do that in the App Cafe. You can click on Configure, and you can go look at the, uh, oh, excuse me, hit the repository settings, and you can change your branch here and go from production down to edge, or you could even say custom, and maybe you have some custom repo you'd like to point it at. That's possible as well. But for most users, you'll probably toggle between production and edge. And I turn on developer mode, which just basically shows extra information during installs and, and whatnot. If there are updates available for any applications, a yellow bar will flash right across the top tabs here, letting you know, hey, there's updates. Let's click here to apply them, and it'll walk you through doing it. When you're browsing for applications, by default, it's going to show out of the 2000 set, everything with icons, metadata, those are our PBIs. But you can come and enable raw packages as well and browse through the entire gory package uh, repository. So if you want to see everything, including, you know, 3000 Perl libs, um, you can do that. Like that's, that's all possible through the GUI. So you don't even have to hit the command prompt once to install pretty much anything. So we're going to go ahead and quit this now. So uh, next up, we're going to take a look at the control panel. This is also a default icon on your desktop. And in the control panel, this is kind of, uh, you know, your, your center for everything PCBSD related. All of our graphical utilities are going to be available right here. As you can see, we have the App Cafe, which we were just in. Um, update Manager, which is also running down on the tray here, letting you know when there's important security updates, whenever FreeBSD issues an update, that's where it's going to pop up. Um, the About information is always good. If you want to know what version of PCBSD you're running, maybe some information about the hardware, etc. And of course we have uh, some GUIs for doing Active Directory and LDAP. An interesting one here is the Boot Manager. And we'll just open up that real quick. But if you are new to PCBSD or, or FreeBSD or ZV, uh, ZFS, so one cool thing we've done with PCBSD starting in 10 and, and going on is we've moved to ZFS only. Like that's our default file system. That's what we do and that's what we're all about. 
One of the cool things ZFS brings is the ability to do something called boot environments. So in ZFS, being a copy on write file system, we can make a snapshot of the entire system, like everything, within you know milliseconds. It doesn't take very long to create a full snapshot of the system. But we can then use um, a bootloader such as Grub to do booting from that snapshot. So what will happen is you'll see here I've got a default, which is the one you get installed with but then you'll have snapshots created before updates are installed. So say a kernel update comes out or a big package update or something, um, our tools and utilities are gonna create a snapshot of your, your whole OS right before those updates are applied. And uh, when you reboot, you'll see a list of those. You can boot into your default, which is you know the current state of the system. But say something goes wrong, an update goes sideways, or you know, something just doesn't work, you can always boot back into the old snapshot instantly there. There's no long uh, recovering files process or anything like that. You can literally just select it at the boot prompt, and it boots up just at the state it was uh, when the snapshot was taken. So uh, this utility is going to let you manage those. It, by default, I think it keeps five or six of these automated snapshots. And of course, you can create ones on your own by clicking uh, the icons here to the left for create and remove. And there's also some extra information here for doing some grub config stuff. And we'll close that now. But uh, next up, we have, of course, hardware compatibility. It just checks some of the devices on your system, lets you know what works and what doesn't. Do you have sound? Do you have Wi-Fi, etc. Um, another good one, of course, graphical user manager. So if you are planning on putting a bunch of extra users on this system, you can do that through this utility. It has advanced options, too, to show you all the system users and daemons and you know everything that might be on your system already. Close that. Let's see, next up, of course, display. Some of these things will be coming from the desktop manager as well. I should mention that. Um, the control panel, if you take a look up here, will let you pick um, the desktop environment that you want to see uh, preferences for as well. So in this case, KDE's preferences will be merged into our control panel. So you won't have to go through their system settings utility to, to find your mouse configuration, for example. Okay, so let's take a look here. So this is another good one. So assuming you've uh, installed PCBSD for the first time, you know, nine times out of 10 or more, it'll uh, pick up everything for sound and it'll just work out of box. But say you have multiple audio devices on the system, like this laptop has HDMI or it has, uh, you know, the jacks out for the headphones. In this case, I'm plugged into a USB jack for this microphone that I'm doing this recording on. So you can always bring up the sound recording utility or the sound configuration utility and change that on the fly. So I'm not going to change it now because I don't want to ruin the recording I'm making. But if it doesn't pick up or, you know, doesn't default to the right one, you can always go in here and change it to uh, whatever device you do want to use that you have uh, your audio stuff plugged into. Okay. Now we're going to scroll down here a little bit. Next up, another cool feature of PCBSD is the Warden. And for those who don't know, the Warden is a jail management utility. And FreeBSD, for, okay, well, I guess I should back up here. Most people know what jails are at this point. But for those who don't, jails are just an extremely lightweight way to do vir system virtualization in FreeBSD. As opposed to virtualizing the whole VM and kernel, etc., the jail is pretty much just virtualizing um, a network connection. And then it's a, uh, think of it as an expanded cheroot, if you will, just to kind of oversimplify it. But in this case, that because it's so lightweight, it means you can have literally thousands of these running on a box, give them all different IP addresses, have different services running in them, etc. And you're not having to, you know, allocate huge chunks of RAM to boot up a kernel on each one or whatever. It's it's very, very lightweight. But uh, the Warden is a utility we wrote for PCBSD, which allows us to manage, configure, and, and uh, you know, take care of everything jail-related on the box. So in this case, I've set up... Uh, a jail already called jailbird. I don't have it running at the moment, but uh, you can see here I've configured it on an IP address. If it was up and running, it would show me any ports it's currently listening on, so I can kind of snoop to see what services are doing in there. So the tools, um, again, you can do run the user manager on the jail and add and remove users for the jail. Service manager will let you start and stop services for it. We can check for updates and we can export the jail. So if you have a jail that you're setting up and you like how it works, you got your services all ready to roll, you can always export it and then import it, say, on a headless box or somewhere else that also has the warden. And uh, that's a real convenient way to migrate jails around. I just uh, 
did that on one of my dev servers here at the house and uh, went to a new box, just exported three jails, brought them up, and you know, only took me five minutes worth of time really to do it. But uh, the rest of it was just copying files back and forth. Now, another cool thing about Warden is it's also tied into the ZFS file system. So we can set up snapshots of my jails. So I can say I'd like to do daily snapshots of this jail, or I can go down here and configure it you know, a little bit more fine-grained if I'd like to do hourly, and then how many of them I'd like to keep. And uh, once snapshots have been created, they will be on the time slider here. You can kind of go back and forth and browse what was in those snapshots and restore. So if something happens, like say you're running WordPress in a jail or something, and you do an update that just goes sideways, and you're like, man, I just want to go back to yesterday. Well, it's really just a couple clicks to do that. Okay, so now we'll close up the warden. So another thing we do, uh, have in PCBSD is something called Life Preserver, which I will open. It's down here on the tray as well. So Life Preserver is also, again, a front end to a ZFS, but what it's gonna do is monitor the health of your ZFS file system, the, the pool, if you will. In this case, it's telling me it's good and telling me the last thing it did was a resilver, which was a, uh, I had two disks that were mirrored in this case. It's telling me when the last snapshot was done. And at the moment I have one disk and it's online and all is you know good and well in the world. If something goes wrong, the life preserver will monitor your file system and pop something up and say, oops, you're in a degraded state. Like we've detected problems or like in my case, I had unplugged one of the drives in my laptop and it came right up and said, hey, your, your mirror is broken. Like it's degraded now. Um, you can still run, but you may want to check into that. So it's just a handy way to let you know of potential problems on your file system. But one of the coolest things it does is it lets you restore data. So because I have snapshots set up, I think I'm doing daily on my laptop here and I keep 10 or 15 days worth. I don't recall how I configured it now. But in this case, I can browse back. I can pick the directory I'd like to browse. So we'll say my home directory in this case and I can just slide it back in time and then start browsing uh, different folders in there and see what's uh, see what it was at that point in time. And then I can find something I like and go, oh cool, I would like to restore that and then I can restore it and, and away I go. Again, because it's ZFS, everything's extremely, extremely fast and uh, just super convenient for being able to do backups. And in addition, it also has the ability to replicate, which is probably one of the coolest features about uh, about Life Preserver and ZFS in general. I don't have it turned on at the moment here, but when you're ready to, you'll basically say, I'd like to replicate my entire uh, Z pool to a remote system. You can scan the network looking for um, SSH targets, or like say you have a free NAS box, which is sitting on your network. That makes a great target to uh, export to. You'll set up, of course, your host name, username, whatever port, if you're running SSH on some non-standard port. And then the only requirement is that the remote box be running a compatible version of ZFS and uh, has a data set available for you to uh, send and receive to. So you set that up here, you'd set the frequency. So you could say, I'd like to you know, replicate my system every time a snapshot's taken, which is great if you're doing say daily snapshots, or you can do them more frequently. You know, I'd like to do it hourly or every 30 minutes replicate or manually. I wanna only do it when I click replicate, but uh, that would be how you set it up there. Okay, so we will close Life Preserver. So that's a kind of a quick overview of the PCBSD system, some of the utilities built in, some of the, the things that we've developed specifically for running you know, FreeBSD on the desktop, along with a ZFS under the hood. Um, of course, we've really just kind of scratched the surface here. There's a lot of stuff you can do. I mean, it is a full feature desktop if you're coming from the Linux world. Uh, you're going to see a lot of the same stuff here. I mean, KDE is KDE pretty much when you run it on Linux or run it on FreeBSD or PCBSD or whatever. Same with GNOME 3, same with Cinnamon, same with Mate, etc. So it's actually really cool because if you're coming over, it's like at first glance, it's like, oh, I'm not really having to learn a whole lot of new stuff to uh, to make the switch. But when you start digging in, go, oh, I like I like boot environments. This is really convenient. And then, of course, once you start digging into the command prompt, you'll, some of the uh, other differences between FreeBSD and Linux will quickly become more apparent how it does package management, how the kernel is is set up in the world, etc. So uh, definitely a lot of fun to play with, but PCBSD makes it extremely simple and uh, painless to get you started as opposed to uh, maybe installing FreeBSD out of box and having to set up XORG and, and do all that by hand. 
So anyway, we hope you enjoyed the tutorial this week. Uh, glad we were finally able to do it. In a future episode, I'd love to do a, a kind of a demo walkthrough of the installation, showing you some of the different options you can pick for uh, ZFS, maybe setting up like mirrors or RAID Z, uh, ZFS straight from the installation. Um, a lot of that you can set up post-install, but uh, it is neat to be able just to do it right out of box in a couple clicks and you have a you know five disc mirror set up or set up a RAID Z2 or something. It's, it's pretty slick. But I uh, hope you enjoyed this week's tutorial, and uh, we'll be back with our next segment in just a moment. Okay, before we head into our weekly news roundup, we're, of course, going to mention the other sponsor for the show this week, and that's, of course, IX Systems. And uh, we're glad to have them as sponsors. They've been sure. with us for, gosh, almost since the beginning now. Yeah. So it's definitely been a while, but... Uh, they're definitely still out there doing their thing. FreeNAS, another point release, uh, looks like heading down your way here pretty soon. Nice. Um, so uh, so what's some of the things you've done with IX recently, Alan? You uh, ordering any new servers or anything? Uh, working on yet another one soon, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, I guess the, that's the, the first thing is always the, the pre-purchase consultation, right? You, you kind mm -hmm. of... Uh, yeah, walk us through how this goes. Yeah, you have to place an order. Generally, I'm not entirely sure exactly what I need. I just know I have problem X and I need to solve it. And sure. so I can, you know, one of the things I like about IX is I can email them as like, hey, so I'm trying to do this and I was leaning this way, but what do you think? And, uh, you know, they can t tell me what's going to work best for what I'm trying to do. Or, you know, sure. uh, even when it came down to how should I lay out my disks for my RAID Z and, you know. But also it was, you know, I want to um, not use the SAS expander in this case. I want to have discrete wire. And they're like, yeah, we, we mm -hmm. can rig up a chassis that'll do that. And I, cool. that's one of the other things that they are not afraid to build something custom either. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, you don't get yeah, that a lot of other places. <laughs> no, you don't. A lot of our places, it's like, that's the model we have on the website. You either take it or leave it. And yeah. IX is like, no, let's, let's customize that and let's work with it and make it do exactly what you need it to do. Mm -hmm. and I know we've seen some of the definitely crazy custom rigs they've built in the past from those 80 core machines to uh, yeah. uh, how many NICs did that one have we looked the, at? The one, it was actually four separate machines stuffed in one server, but it had 24 10 gigabit NICs. Yes. Which is just yeah. mind-boggling. Now, if that's not a crazy custom job, I don't know what is. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like... That's they, the point. They can do it. They practically <laughs> had to do custom metal work to fit that many nicks in the chassis. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, that's just really, really cool. I was at the office last week, and it's really cool. I should uh, We should see about getting some pictures of the place if they're able to give us, like, a, a demo of the... Yeah, I've seen, you know, like... the process uh, is building. I've seen one or two pictures of, like, the assembly line type thing that I have going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a server with the top open and a pair of the horns stuck around the ram or something but oh, of course <laughs> but yeah I'd, I'd love to see more inside there and, and find out more about how they manage it and uh you know maybe see some of the servers going through that qa process they do where they yeah beat up the server and make sure it's going to uh stand up to being used properly uh before yes, they ship it very to you. extensive burn in like they don't leave anything to chance here we're not going to assume the drive that they got is is not a lemon they're going to battle test it for you before it hits your server rack yeah to try and, and that makes a big difference for us. It does. It does. I mean, not only because time is money, but you know, shipping and everything else associated with racking it. And, oh, we need to take this drive out now. It's yeah. like no, they try and well, yeah, let's get that all sorted out before they even ship it out. Yeah. Well, for us, you know, a data center visit is usually a scheduled thing. You know, like mm -hmm. we can go whenever we want, but you know, it's it's seventy five kilometers away, so we kind of plan out when we're going to do it. And so because of that, uh, having to being able to avoid a second trip by having them test the hard drives for us first is a big difference for us. Yes, very important, very yeah. important. So uh, the URL is the same as it has been. It's ixsystems.com slash BSD now. You know, check it out, fill out the info, get in touch with their folks over there, and they'll definitely be able to hook you up with any kind of custom solution you guys are looking for. Everything mm -hmm. from uh, a tiny Mac Mini, or not Mac Mini, excuse me, FreeNAS Mini. Yep. Um, all the way up to again these monster eighty core systems we've looked at in the past. Yeah, or uh, or that all running the that one machine that had uh, was it one hundred and ninety seven four terabyte drives in it. Yeah, yeah. In case you have some small storage problems yeah. or something. Yeah, if you have small storage <laughs> problems. <laughs> but of course, these are all running the latest and greatest Intel processors. And yes, uh, that that was know. one of the other things. Uh, back when mm -hmm. I, I bought the machine that is my router here now, um, it was when the uh, Haswells were just first coming out. And mm -hmm. so uh, 
um, for those um, Super Micro, I had just came out with the new X10 series of motherboards as well. And mm -hmm. iX hadn't finished their uh, testing phase where they certified the motherboard and yes, says everything on it works with FreeBSD and it'll be great. And sure. they hadn't actually finished that yet, but I wanted the latest Haswell processor anyway. So uh, I worked with them and they're like, yeah, it's like, as long as you understand that it's like, yes, it's like, if there's a problem, I will help you fix it. <laughs> you know, sure. that's, uh, I'm perfectly happy to be the guinea pig in this case. Uh, and uh, so they got the, the processor shipped like directly from uh, Taiwan or wherever they're manufactured uh, in order to get it for me. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, being able to do that is just something that you wouldn't get at some other hardware manufacturer. Yeah, that kind of hands-on just doesn't happen usually. Yeah. So, I mean, and, uh, you can't put a price tag on that. That's worth so much. <laughs> yeah. And if you have to convince your management, also check out their uh, the ultimate guide to buying a new server for open source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, a, that's also available at the website, ixsystems.com slash BSD now. Fill it out, and then you can download that PDF and... Uh, mm -hmm read through it, give you some uh, talking points, talk to management about why you need to use iX systems as your next hardware vendor. Okay. So cool. Okay. Well, let's uh, get right into the news roundup then for the week. Yes. So uh, first up, we got a, this is actually kind of cool that it's already been committed, but a new tool called PackageFS was just committed to FreeBSD Current, and we'll have the link to the uh, subversion log here if you'd like to take a look. Mm -hmm. But essentially what it is, it's a file system implementation for reading files out of a compressed tarball a la packages, which is yep. what people are probably going to be using this a lot for. But I suppose other tarballs would work as well, right, Alan? Just uh, yeah, you might be able to feed anything in where any, you any need tar compressed data. Where you need to read the data sequentially. Uh, so yeah. says, the file system assumes that the files are laid out in the same order uh, as needed to allow for the package to be streamed. Uh, mm -hmm. So as such, it does not read an entire package into memory first. Sure. So it just reads but the files as is needed. Yeah, that's actually really slick, but I guess it'll let users now view package NG packages or, as we said, any compressed tarball just like NFS, Samba, SSHFS, etc. So that is actually in current now. I don't know if it's going to get backported in time for 10.1. It would yep. be neat, but uh, yeah, do that now. That's, and that's really neat. <laughs> interestingly, uh, this was obtained from uh, Juniper Networks. That's where mm -hmm. this was built, and then they contributed it back. Yeah, so that was, that was very... Also nice uh, to see people uh, doing that. Mm-hmm. Okay, next up. So what have we got? A BSD Magazine, it looks like, has a yep. new issue out, July 2014, and we have the link to it here. But uh, this uh, this issue has some cool topics, including using Wireshark in a uh, SAN environment, some more GIMP uh, tutorials, interview with uh, Brett Davis over at IX Systems talking about TrueNAS, which yep. is their commercial version of FreeNAS, and uh, also an article about PackageNG in Dragonfly BSD, and uh, you know a few other things. So... Uh, course it's a free download so you'll want to go grab that pdf throw it on yep. your favorite e-reading device and uh, check out a lot of good information there okay so what's the next one we got alan the next one Something is uh, open? yeah an interview uh, um with uh, some of the developers of open smtbd mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh giles again who we've had on the show uh but he's talking sure. uh so he gets asked how the development process for open smt looks and uh how many different developers are involved in the process Mm -hmm. And it kind of explains how they make both, they have a master version, which is the one for OpenBSD, and then a portable version, which is the one that's available on Linux and FreeBSD and so on. Cool. And uh, they talk about that, uh, what the testing process looks like, and what do they do for that, um, how do they decide what new features are going to go in, and, you know, balancing kind of that, uh, the simplicity and, and, and smallness of OpenSMPBD versus, mm -hmm. you know, everybody wants more features, right? And it's yeah. how, do you, how do you balance, you know, when a feature is worth having and, and when it's not? Mm -hmm. Well, if you go take a look at the uh, link here, you know, don't freak out at first if it's in Russian. Scroll down. The yeah. English is there, I promise. It is in that English. Hit me. I was like, oh, wait, wait, this is Russian. I can't, oh, no, yeah. there it is. <laughs> but yeah, if you scroll down, it's actually in English, which helps a lot. <laughs> yes, definitely. And okay, also, next, the, they also oh, talk about uh, performance and stability testing, mm -hmm. uh, some slides, uh, they found that, in general, um, the bottleneck for OpenSMTBD is always going to be your disk for sure. as far as how much mail can you deliver per second. Um, you know, it comes down to your file system and your disk and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they measure their code quality and coverage and, uh, you know. All that good stuff. They say, uh, they, apparently, they built their own testing framework called SMTP Script, uh, which mm -hmm. allows them to basically script the actions that they want to do in the, to test it. And then it talks a little bit more about the uh, 
the OpenBSD versus the portable version and how those work. Okay. And then uh, ask for, obviously, more uh, volunteers to do stability testing. And mm-hmm. ah, They had one here. That, uh, they were trying to do a, a flash mob, basically. They sent out mm-hmm. a tweet asking uh, everyone to send a bunch of emails to discard at test.opensmtvd.org. And uh, they processed uh, 12.3 million emails and didn't have any problems. Nice. Nice. So yeah, cool. it's definitely a good read. You should check it out, especially if you're yeah. interested in uh, mail servers or OpenSMTBD in general mm-hmm. and their awesome logo. <laughs> <laughs> that is cool. Okay, so the last story we have in the news roundup this week is uh, FreeBSD is a syslog server. Yep. So, uh, you know, I'm sure a number of sysadmins can uh, agree with this. If you have a large number of servers, examining their logs individually is just a pain in the butt. Yep. Nobody, nobody likes to have to do that. So uh, fortunately, you can configure them to send their logs to a dedicated system to receive them. So this blog post is pretty much going through the process of how you would set up client systems as well as the server system to get all your logs in one place. And of course, all being done on a FreeBSD box in this case. So it looks like he uh, took 10.0 release, just a stock system, and uh, the article is going to walk you first through configuring the server. So, um, you know, what syslog D flags do you need to use, what addresses to listen on, etc. And then uh, even covers uh, managing the logs with new syslogs mm-hmm. so that you rotate those and, and decide how many days worth you want to keep. Sure. Do you want to compress them with gzip or bzip or xzip and so on or exit mm-hmm. and, you know, restarting the services, get it running and uh, how it goes. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a pretty cool little walkthrough on how to do this. It's uh, definitely helpful. And then, of course, after that, he moves on to the clients. So that part's actually a lot easier. But uh, you just walk through the client and point it at the server, and away it goes. Yep. Pretty stinking simple. But, uh, yeah, definitely check that out. If you manage you know, any number of boxes, more than one, <laughs> you, yep. and you're tired of having to log into them all and figure out what the logs or, are. Or uh, specifically, whatnot. sometimes the thing that you're trying to get to log via syslog mm-hmm. doesn't have its own hard drive. Sure. Uh, like a lot of like embedded devices, like little routers and firewalls mm-hmm. and stuff, don't really have any kind of persistent storage, other maybe a bit of flash to try to store logs. And so you would set them sure. up to uh, send their logs off to a machine that can actually store the logs mm-hmm. and deal Keep with you know. If if you have a tiny forensic slitter. yeah, if you have a tiny MIPS processor, you don't want to try to be doing compressing the log files on that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Whereas if you send them off to a FreeBSD machine that has a regular processor, it can compress them without getting slowed down. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, definitely an interesting read. Uh, We recommend you take a look at that if you're interested in setting that up. Okay, and uh, we'll be back in just a moment with our uh, next segment. Okay, we're back with uh, feedback from you guys out in the audience. So we'll get right into our first question. Looks like from uh, Andre asking about NAS businesses. Mm -hmm. So he says, hey, guys, thanks for your job in BSDnow.tv. First, I'd like to thank you for the videos on the tube and then on YouTube and for the tutorials, of course. He said he's a newbie, 43 years old, albeit, in a BSD. He said it all started when he found a cheap NAS software for a company he had to work with. He started to study NAS in SAN. So a year ago, he discovered free NAS. He built a a 16 terabyte server, tested it, and started to use it. He's been using this system with no problems since then. So very yes. cool. Good success story there. So he found out for, you know, FreeNAS, of course, is based on FreeBSD and started to learn about it. I guess that's to, interesting. Uh, is that, yeah, I guess you know a lot of people find FreeNAS, think it's cool, but don't realize what it's actually based on. Yeah, yeah. And then, then they discover real oh, technology under there. It's not just, you know, it's not like a regular appliance where, you know, it's whatever it is under the hood. It's just mm-hmm. that appliance, but it's actually FreeBSD in there. Yeah. Yep, yep. Cool. So he said uh, he found out you know, FreeNAS was based on FreeBSD. So to practice, he said he built a simple server to learn more about the system. He's installed FreeBSD, implemented a simple ZFS pool, shared it with Samba with a Windows machine. He said he will test it and compare it to the FreeNAS he has. After that, he's going to try to implement Hast and CARP to test the FreeNAS machine and test the FreeBSD machine. So he said, here in Brazil, small companies do not have enough money to buy SAN appliances. I am thinking about starting a company to build these machines after learning a lot about FreeBSD and open source systems and sell or rent them for small business clients. What do you think of this idea? Is it a dumb idea? Do you know of any companies that did something like this and succeeded? Well, um, I would say... Do you know of any um, rentals? I've never heard of one. Well, not but. necessarily rental, but I would say that... 
I think at least a third of all BSD developers I know run some kind of consultancy where they do things like this for small businesses in their mm-hmm. area. Sure. So, yes, I would definitely say that that happens a lot. I don't know that anybody yeah. necessarily focuses specifically on NAS, but, yes, uh, storage is a big market right now. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, places are always looking for people that have the expertise and, and you know, a lot of times they're not going to care uh, which appliance it is. And so you get to pick, and the more FreeBSD that's out there, the better. Yeah, I mean, if there's a need there in Brazil and whatever yeah. town you're in, then sure. I mean, I mean, what's the harm in trying? Yep. But, uh, yeah, I've never heard of anyone doing a rental model, but that's intriguing, I Yeah, suppose. I guess uh, often, most times, I guess you would, you know, uh, if you're buying a sand, you usually have to lease it because it costs $400,000. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. But, uh, okay. Well, we wish you luck with all that, Andre, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, let us know how it goes later yes. on. Uh, ping back to us. Yeah, okay. So next, next up, uh, Vincent. Vincent. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll take this one. He said uh-huh. he's uh, having a problem with using uh, virtualization with Zen Server. Uh, specifically, Zen Server performs perfectly, but unfortunately, the NAS that is available is a few years old and can't deliver anywhere near the performance that they're going to need. Uh, apparently, it's only giving about five megabytes per second. Uh, Ooh. And the one he has uh, that's slightly newer can do seventy megabits or megabytes a second. On the uh, the same box can deliver. 30 to 40 over file shares. Mm-hmm. So, so he's looking at replacing the slow NAS with a free NAS and then reusing that NAS as a backup uh, for the free NAS. Uh, sure. So he's kind of lists off some specs of a machine he's looking at, which is uh, very similar to the free NAS mini. It's the Intel Atom server machine, the eight core with um, uh, supports the encryption offload. Uh, and then using an LSI uh, 9207-8i, which is a very good card. I have two of those in my basement in my storage rack machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he says he would prefer the Super Micro uh, expansion card, but uh, I'm pretty sure that that Super Micro, I don't know about that specific Super Micro, but the Super Micro board in my server from IX is actually the exact same chip as the 9207-8i. Hmm. Uh, so okay. Super Micro just embeds that same LSI chip. So it's probably the same thing. Uh, mm-hmm. And he said he's got a hot swap case that has the 16 drive bays, uh, 64 gigs of ECC RAM, uh, the 14 Western Digital Red 3 terabyte drives, and... Uh, an Intel 320 40 gig SSD, and then the two uh, crucial MX100 SSDs. So he's got the small 40 gig SSD for the OS, and then the two 256 gig SSDs, I'm guessing, for L2 Arc. Mm-hmm. And he says the board has two Intel NICs, uh, and the only PCI E slot will obviously be taken up by the LSI card. Uh, so he's wondering which way he should lay out his uh, pool. Or actually, he was talking about having three separate pools. Uh, seven of the disks in RAID Z3 uh, for network file shares using Active Directory, uh, mm-hmm. seven more of the disks as a Z3 for his iSCSI targets, and two disks mirrored uh, with the SSDs for network shares. Um, depending what you're needing, uh, that can have advantages of splitting your pool in half like that and having two separate pools. Obviously, uh, it allows you to control the uh, kind of the Provisioning in the IOPS, you know, it means no matter how busy the iSCSI is, it's not going to affect your network file shares. Sure. Uh, however, if you put the two gangs together, uh, basically two seven disk VDEVs of Z3 in one pool, um, then you would get twice as much uh, speed available so that if, you know, your network file share isn't using all of the speed, uh, all the IOPS of the disk, that means there's that many more IOPS available to the iSCSI target. Um, and, you know, if you put the two pools together, you probably don't need to quite go Z3 on both. Uh, you know, you mm-hmm. could do something like, uh, I guess with 14 disks, you could probably do something like two Z2s and get that much more space. Or uh, what you might try to do is split that up into uh, more groups that way. But I guess, uh, yeah, he's, all of his drive bays are full, so he's kind of limited in what he can do. But Sure. Yeah. He also asked, where the, will the SSDs be able to use trim? Yes. Uh, ZFS has supported trim on FreeBSD since 9.2. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, yeah, it's been a while. So, yeah, when you do the zpool create command, it will trim the whole disk at the, or the whole partition that you use at the start and then do trim from there, uh, which uh, you'll notice it working because when you 
create the pool with the SSDs, it'll take a couple of minutes because it has to trim that, you know, a whole bunch of space. Like, uh, mm-hmm. I think the 120 gig drive I did took like three minutes or something. Um, mm. Whereas normally Gpool create takes like five seconds, right? Or less. Sure, sure. Not, so you notice that happening. Uh, there is a CCTL you can set to make it not do that if you know that you've already secure erased your SSD and you don't want to A, waste the time doing it and B, um, you know, add that much more wear to your SSD. But usually mm-hmm. it's not a big deal. Uh, he says the workload is 95% reads. Uh, and, it, you know, he says he would like the writes to be at least 20 to 30 megabytes a second. He says he knows RAID Z3 has a write hole. Uh, he says it has a write hole, but I don't think he understands what that means. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, the write hole is about data going missing, and that doesn't happen in RAID Z as opposed to RAID 5 or 6. And uh, sure. I think he thought that meant it spe- uh, slows down the speed. Um in general, my six disk RAID Z2 array at home, if you're doing a, a, a sequential write, like if you're writing in a straight line, uh, which almost every write in ZFS is like that, um, mm-hmm. then you can expect to get hundreds of megabytes per second. Uh, you know, I can read a file straight off the disk that's not in the arc, uh, although the prefetch starts putting it in the arc, uh, at sure. six to 700 megabytes a second with six desktop drives. Uh, so obviously you can get it's not it's not a slouch <laughs> yeah uh so 20 to 30 megabytes per second is not going to be a problem at all uh mm-hmm. the biggest thing is uh it'll depend if you're doing asynchronous versus synchronous writes if you're doing a synchronous write it's not so much the megabytes per second that'll be the issue it'll be limited by the response time the latency because it, with a synchronous write you do the write and then you have to wait until zfs is flushed and, and says it's done before you do the next mm-hmm. one if that's where you're getting slowed down, then you should look at uh, maybe using those two SSDs as a ZIL instead, although 256 gig is too big for a ZIL. Uh, or you don't need all of that for a ZIL, so maybe you partition them or something. Um, mm-hmm. Because then what it'll do is when you request that synchronous write, which is oftentimes what Zen Server is going to do, uh, it will write it to the SSD very quickly and say, okay, I'm done. And then it'll flush it out to the spinning disk after. Uh, and that way you'll get that, uh, reduce that latency. Uh, because, you know, an SSD takes, uh, you know, on the order of 100 times less uh, milliseconds or microseconds to write than a regular hard drive. Like a regular hard drive sure. has a latency that's like 15 milliseconds, whereas um, SSDs are like a thousand times faster than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he says, is the S- Intel SSD overkill for the OS drive? Probably. Uh, most people just run FreeNAS itself off like a USB stick or something. Mm-hmm. Um, you might consider using that SSD as a ZIL, although you probably want your ZIL to be rated uh, or mirrored. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, if my servers use the Western Digital Reds, uh, the servers I bought from AX used the Western Digital Enterprise SAS drives, uh, but they cost quite a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, he says, he's followed the guidelines for RAID Z3, but would you recommend another setup for the drives? Um, because you're using 14, it's kind of an odd number, but uh, it's not easy to divide that by three <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, or four, really. So there's not many other configurations. I just might say having one pool uh, with all 14 drives uh, split across some VDEVs would probably be better. Um, if you were worried mostly about the read speed and the IOPS, uh, then you might consider doing all 14 drives uh, in sets of mirrors so you'd have you know seven mirrors uh, Mm -hmm. making up one pool and that'll give you the highest number of uh, operations per second on the pool which is probably what'll make the biggest difference for uh zen server sure okay he said did you consider atoms for your servers uh no i didn't because most of my servers are also doing other things and so, mm-hmm. uh, for example, most of our video, our big story servers also have to take care of transcoding the video, uh, mm-hmm. converting it and stuff. So they need beefy uh, yeah, E5s. Cut it there. Yeah, yeah, we use beefy dual E5s. <laughs> All of our servers have mm-hmm. the, you know two processors of the high-end E5 uh, mm-hmm. and are, are dealing with processing the video as well. And so that makes a difference. Cool. Okay. Well, I think you answered most oh, of the And he also there. says, uh, what is your view about when an L2 arc is required? Uh, specifically, Please. an L2 arc is only required when you can't fit any more RAM in the machine or you can't afford any more RAM for the machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's only uh, L2 arc only helps the read speed. 
by caching stuff. And but uh, basically, the one good way to tell is in the porch tree. There's a tool called ZFS Stats, uh, mm -hmm. and it has a, a an interactive tool called ZFS Mon, which basically gives you a top style display of what's happening with the ZFS caching systems. And basically, if your cache hit ratio isn't high enough, the L2 arc isn't going to do anything. You know, sure. if you're if you're reading a different file every time, then you're basically, you know, the SSD is going to be constantly caching something different, and it's just going to wear out the SSD and never actually hit right. Uh, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, if you're getting very good cache hit ratios, then adding more uh, room to the arc will give you more cache hits. It's it's very much a trade off, but the best way is basically to look at it under load and or look at your existing workload and try to decide. Um, you know, obviously, RAM is faster than SSDs, so sure. the bigger your arc, the better. Uh, especially, oftentimes people will put an L2 arc in a machine because they have very little RAM, without realizing that the L2 adding an L2 arc uses more RAM, so mm -hmm. it actually makes less RAM available. So it can actually hurt performance if you uh, have a giant L2 arc and not enough RAM. Yeah. RAM is always the first solution. Yes. You got to add as much memory as possible. Yeah, and uh, he's got 64 gigs, so he should be doing pretty good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he'll be fine. Uh, so he'll also cool. be safe with adding an L2 arc, uh, but whether or not he needs one, that'll mostly depend mm -hmm. on basically looking at the workload and, and, and deciding. And yes, also, you know, if your workload is not that much read, well, he said it's 95% read. So uh, it'll mm -hmm. depend, you know, is that 95% of the time you're reading the same 1% of same the data? gigs over and yeah, over. Or, <laughs> you know, and uh, basically how big is your working set and will it fit in RAM and will it, would it also fit if you had the RAM and the SSD? Because uh, if the RAM and the SSD still aren't big enough to hold your whole working set, your SSD is just probably going to basically have a revolving door of that overly large working set, and it's never going to actually give you much efficiency. Although uh, ARC, as opposed to uh, or the adaptive reactive cache, and, or adaptive replacement cache, as opposed to the original older style um, LRU, least recently used, is better about slowing down that revolving door by basically keeping track of stuff that has been in cache and didn't work out so it doesn't get mm -hmm. back in the cache. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, it's the kind of thing you can't really tell ahead of time. So, yeah, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up we have a Callum wrote in, and I guess it's about a reply you had done a couple weeks ago, Alan, um, about the lack of a graphical console in Beehive. So he said, it struck me that a couple other options exist that we may want to mention. So we will do that right here in the air. So firstly, he says you can run Linux or OpenBSD graphical utilities using a remote display back to the host's FreeBSD desktop display, either directly or via an SSH tunnel. This is true. He said for many applications, this is perfectly adequate. And he said he uses this method to run uh, YAS2 in a headless SUSE VBox or to run Firefox in Ubuntu to ask, access his works VPN. So that's definitely a, a possibility if you're doing this via Beehive. He said, secondly, if you need to run a full desktop, you can try running it in an XVNC session in the Beehive guest and then connecting remotely to that with VNC Viewer. So that would give you a little bit more uh, native experience, which again is... Uh, an interesting solution yeah, for I think, running a Beehive. I, I think one of our very first tutorials was about running mm -hmm. VNC on a headless machine or something. Yeah. About yeah, doing something like that. that. Um, yes, although that doesn't help you, for example, install the graphical OS. <laughs> sure, <laughs> is, sure. Is the issue. Uh, so, I'll be post. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Basically, if, if the installer doesn't support serial, then you're going to run into issues there. But, mm -hmm. yeah, once it's up and running... Sure, it's just, it depends what you're trying to do with it, whether using VNC is a good enough solution or not. Mm -hmm. He said, obviously, none of these solutions are going to be great for gra graphics-intensive applications, you know, yeah. which makes sense. He said he's briefly experimented with Beehive so far and mainly used VirtualBox, which can't be mixed with Beehive, it seems. But for someone keen to go down the Beehive route, these would be worth trying. Well, they have been noted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. th but the, the not working with VMware or uh, with uh, VirtualBox Virtual Box. is specific to just the way the hardware works, right? The hardware mm -hmm. um, virtualization acceleration feature, uh, the VTX or uh, VMM, doesn't support that, and so it's it's a common problem with any mixing any two virtualization software together. Basically, mm -hmm. it's not a Beehive specific problem. Sure. Okay, next up, Stephen asking about logs. He said, uh, "He said first of all, thank you for addressing questions about running FreeBSD on a Raspberry Pi on uh, this last week's show. He said, the podcast is fantastic. Well, thank you, Stephen. 
We appreciate that. He said, uh, we mentioned we were running out of topics, which made me think of something else to suggest if we really needed something. He said, perhaps we could give some tips on how to interpret the contents of BSD system logs. Is a copy and paste into a search engine the best way to uh, understand what's going on, or is there a better method to interpret them, especially after a crash or a reset? He says, for example, his FreeNAS server is constantly emailing him cryptic security reports on a daily basis. I guess we yeah, could I don't know if that... cover how to read those uh, the two daily reports that FreeBSD sends out. That would sure. be interesting. Yeah, maybe important things to look for. Uh, yep. yeah, well, yeah, because uh, one of the things that's in the security report is any new binaries that have shown up that have the set UID bit set. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you didn't install those, that's a big uh, red flag. Yeah, like, and yeah, so, yeah. something <laughs> is wrong. Yeah, that would be a, a good uh, tutorial and a good section for the handbook. So uh, that's okay. a very good idea, talking about how to read those reports. Uh, for the other logs, generally the log kind of explains mm -hmm. what it's talking about. Um, sure. After a panic in particular, um, yeah, there's a big output that has a backtrace, but there's like one of the lines that will have the most useful bit of information telling you what the problem actually was. And then yeah, the rest... What caused this? Yeah. It's, 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 there was this problem, and then it gives uh, a breakdown of where in the code the CPU was executing when it happened. So that usually gives mm -hmm. the, the people at the FreeBSD project an idea where to look for that problem. Because I actually ran into one of these uh, recently. Uh, I updated to the latest... Uh, head and uh, was having some trouble where under extremely heavy load my zfs server would uh crash with this uh kind of strange bug about the uh one of the zfs features and uh, it mm. turned out it was uh a problem with the way it was ported from solaris to freebsd and the fact that when these two different operations happened uh the, the time in nanoseconds was the same and so it thought that that shouldn't be able to happen because one of them was oh. using a less precise version of get what time it is in mm -hmm. nanoseconds because finding out what time it is in nanoseconds is very expensive. So there's a, sure. there's a less accurate one uh, and using that in the one case actually caused a problem. But I quickly okay. worked with uh, actually uh, Zin Lee from IX Systems and we got that sorted out and the patch has been put into head. Uh, but, you know, that crash log uh, was what it enabled me to report the problem and enabled Zin to know where in the code it happened it and trace it back to, it's like somebody actually uh, accidentally fixed this three years ago, but then reverted it because they didn't mean to fix it. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> or rather, you know, uh, they made a change, yeah. a local change, and it crept in, and it was just funny that this, the fix to my problem was revert a change from three years ago. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which yep. was actually, that commit was actually reverting a change they had made the commit before when they didn't mean to. <laughs> but... Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, uh, we could definitely do one about reading the uh, yeah, the daily and security cool. reports. And then the other logs, if you have something more specific, uh, we'd love to help you with that. All right. Well, cool. Well, our last question for the week comes from John asking about a free NAS follow-up. So he says, just to follow up on this, he said he went with option D. He sold a kidney and got the extra two four terabyte drives. I think it was a couple weeks ago he wrote Yeah, in. and he had a, a mix of different about. sizes and asking which way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I talked about... Oh, this is one that will do the best right now. This is the one that will let you expand and, and deal with it best going forward and so on. Yep. So he said uh, FreeNAS made it really easy to do via the GUI over the weekend. He said he pulled out one drive at a time and replaced it until all four were replaced and resilvered, and the size magically grew to 7.5 terabytes. How awesome is that? A beautiful thing, he says. Yeah, um, so, so specifically, says, if you have enough SATA ports, it's better to connect the new drive at the same time so you have all three mm -hmm. drives happening at once so you're not actually relying on the redundancy. Um, sure. But if you don't have them, you can rely on it. It's just slightly riskier. Mm -hmm. He's, yeah, because there's the off chance that maybe doing the resilvering could you know, trigger a bug or hard drive crash. Yeah, one, one of the other... The, uh, yeah, if you only have RAID Z1, then you can only use one drive at a time. So if you pull one out, mm -hmm. if one of the others dies under the stress of reading the entire disk and writing it to the new disk, um, that could actually cause you to lose yeah, your data. that's a bad thing. Yeah. So <laughs> if you have the spare SATA ports, you can connect the new drive and the old drive at the same time and do the ZFS mm -hmm. replace command or uh, zpool replace command, and that'll uh, give you, without, you... It'll do the same operation without the risk. Yes. But yes. it's not it's always an option, redundancy. and, you know... Uh, obviously, if the drive is already dead, then you don't really have a choice. But anyway. Mm -hmm. He said, of course, well done, FreeBSD and IX systems. But he also says, uh, Alan, you mentioned something about a, a ZFS X for script yep. for backups, etc. 
He said he's uh, interested in using this for USB external backups. He said he found some code up on Google somewhere that hasn't been updated since 2011, and he's asking if you're working somewhere else or working on this stuff. Yes, uh, so I've been using the ZX for Tool uh, since about 2010, and uh, yeah, I'm, at some point I was like, hey, uh, this doesn't work anymore with FreeBSD 8.2 and 9.1 or whatever, uh, when mm -hmm. uh, some new properties were introduced in the FreeBSD ZFS. Uh, specifically, uh, I think it was logically used and logically referenced, which allow you to tell uh, with uh, when you have compression on, it keeps track of how much space would be taken if you didn't have compression. Because that sure. can, um, when you're doing quotas, uh, sometimes you want to quota people based on how much space they're actually taking uh, or how much space they would be taking rather than what they're actually taking. So that, you know, if mm -hmm. you give a user a quota of a terabyte, or 100 gigabytes or whatever, uh, and they write data and it's compressible, then they they have free space left and they can write more. But then if they replace some file and it's less compressible, it takes up more of their space. It's like, sure. but I didn't write any more files and all of a sudden I have less space. It gets very confusing. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, so the ZX for tool didn't have those properties on the list of features in that cause or of, of uh, properties that are read only, uh, because obviously you don't set the logically used. Uh, one, it's one ZFS counts for you. Uh, and sure. so when you replicate, you don't want to set that. And uh, because of that, it uh, would cause the tool not to be able to work. So I just patched my local version and went on my way. But then I realized, it's like, well, everybody else is going to run into this problem too. Uh, so uh, eventually I started just you know, making my version available. And then I decided that the right way to do it was I copied the code off uh, the dead Google project, put it on GitHub, and then uh, took over maintainership of the port and made the GitHub page the source of it. And I've released a new version that, in addition to uh, supporting all those newer features, also had the option of uh, adding a progress bar. If you install something hmm. like mbuffer nice. or CLP bar or progress or whichever command line progress bar option you like, um, it can support that uh, with the capital D flag. And I'm actually uh, working on some changes. I've hoped to push a new version uh, this weekend into the ports tree um, that also supports the stuff in FreeBSD head, specifically the properties. Um, you can limit the number of snapshots or the number of sub file systems that have been created under a file system. So when you use mm -hmm. ZFS delegation or uh, the jail property to give control over a data set to a user or to a uh, root in a jail, uh, you can limit how many file systems they cr can create so they can't do a, basically a resource exhaustion attack by just creating one billion file systems or one billion oh, nice. snapshots. Mm -hmm. So you can actually set a quota on how many snapshots they're allowed to create. Uh, okay. But that runs into the same problem of when you're replicating that. Um, and that one isn't a read-only property, but uh, in my case, my problem is that I actually have mixed FreeBSD versions. Uh, you know, I upgrade the first server and the backup server doesn't get upgraded right away because what if the upgrade doesn't work and causes the system to crash constantly? I don't want the backup doing that as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I'm mismatching versions, sometimes the source will have the newer feature and the destination won't. Uh, so I wrote a, a feature into ZX for that will only copy properties if they're supported by both pools. If the destination doesn't have that property, it'll skip copying it and print a warning about it instead. So that you can replicate from an 11 to a 9.2 or 9.3, and you're not going to get the warning about that uh, file system snapshot limit. Uh, and so I added that. Um, and the options to override a couple of the things that were, you know, little things people have reported. You, did you say where your code is hosted Yeah, it's, now? Uh, is it it's on GitHub, uh, Alan okay. Jude slash ZXfer, and uh, the mm -hmm. ports tree version of ZXfer points there and has the URL and stuff. I'm also working on okay. updating the man page to add the new features I've added. Uh, cool. I think there was one other thing I added that was interesting. Oh, uh, there were two problems. That uh, limit on the number of file systems, when you look at the limit, it says the default is none. But when mm -hmm. you, um, a problem we ran into when using uh, the port of ZFS to the Mac and also anyone who is using ZFS in languages other than English. Uh, for example, if mm. you have the German or French localizations turned on, then the size uh, will use, in French and German, they use a comma as the decimal separator and the dot as the thousand separator instead wow. of the other way around like we do in English. Yeah, yeah. And so um, when you would 
set trying to set the property and setting the size and you put a comma in it zf has to be like what are you doing you can't have a comma in the so file sad. size <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Or, and things like that and and so uh there's a switch in zfs uh f- almost that works on like uh, almost every command that makes it uh machine readable so it prints it out as mm. just the number instead well, the problem was for the limit on the number of file systems and snapshots, the limit of none prints out strangely. Um, mm-hmm. I guess internally is represented by negative one, meaning no limit, but the system actually interprets that as two to the power of 64 minus one, which is a number about this long. Sure. Um, and so when you replicate it, it would actually set it to that limit, which isn't actually what you meant. You meant I want it to be set to none. Uh, so I had to add a feature to, to sort that out as well. Mm-hmm. So this way it cool. can uh, replicate between systems with different localizations and different uh, languages, and it can uh, replicate the properties that have uh, strange special settings. Because uh, the quota also, uh, there's a difference between a quota of none and a quota of zero. They don't mean the same thing. Uh, mm-hmm. And so you wanted to uh, make sure that if it was set to none, you wanted to not replicate it versus if it's set to zero, you mean you want it actually locally set to zero. Sure. So, yeah. uh, there's so your, your port's all up to date, I no, assume, the, is what's in GitHub? Uh, no, oh, in no. GitHub, there's some stuff that's currently being tested, and it would be great if people right. could test it and tell me before I push it into the port, because I don't want to break the port. See, there you go. You guys got homework for the next week yes, now. you got to uh, test that out. Let Alan know so he can commit yep, it. Yep, that's uh, github.com slash alanjude slash zxfair. Cool. Okay, that brings us to the end of our questions for the week. So as we wrap up here, of course, we'll mention again that all of our tutorials are posted in their entirety at bsdnow.tv, and uh, you can go check that out. Um, We also uh, ask that you send questions, comments, show ideas, topics, or maybe stories you want mentioned on the show to feedback at bsdnow.tv. Usually our producer TJ will see that and reply back to you first, so uh, be sure to address it to him too when you send it in. Um, if you'd like to come on for an interview or have a tutorial you'd like to see, of course, uh, email us. Let us know so we can get that scheduled. Mm-hmm. If uh, if you want to see how we make the show and see some of the stuff that happens in between the segments and before it gets all cut up and put out on the net on Fridays, you can, of course, watch live Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. We'd love to have you with us, and it's cool if we can interact with you via IRC during that as well. Yep. Uh, speaking of interacting, uh, there's a mm-hmm. New York City BSD users group meeting tonight. Uh, that's yes. at 645 at aboat.com, which is 1500 Broadway, uh, 43rd mm-hmm. Street. And that's on the sixth floor. Uh, you can go to uh, nycbug.org and check out their website and they have the details. So if you're in New York, uh, you should definitely check out the uh, users group. Cool. Also, uh, an important notice that OpenBSD is moving to a new distributor here soon in December, or uh, excuse me, September. So between now and then, this is pretty much your last chance to buy any of the current shirts, CDs, mugs, posters, etc. So if you want any of those, you need to grab them now while you still can. There is a time limit on this. So uh, thanks for being with us this week on the show. We really enjoyed having you guys here and uh, looking forward to next week. What are we hitting, episode 50? Yes, next, next week? week is episode 50. Wow, almost uh, almost a full year. This is crazy, but uh, good. Yeah. You know, you'll know, you have to be here. I'm sure we'll do something special when we hit a year. But uh, anyway, thanks for being with us this week. We'll see you same time next week. Bye.